pointed out the Jerusalem temple to Jesus were overawed. His disciples were, after all, country bumpkins in the big city. They had, perhaps, never seen such magnificence. Since, as Jews, it was their own temple, they were proud of it and wanted to show it off. Jesus' prediction in response to their pride, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, was not quite accurate, or at least not yet. Some stones do remain standing on each other, the famous western or wailing wall of the Temple Mount, a sort of embankment. But the temple itself is gone without a trace. It was destroyed by a Roman army in the year 70. Many of the world's great attractions are, like the Parthenon of Athens, ruins. Many things that were once great attractions no longer exist. The same will be true of our modern wonders. The Eiffel Tower, the Great Wall of China, St. Peter's Basilica, and all the rest of our constructions will disappear. Even nature's wonders will wear out, wash out, and be gone. The Himalayas and the Grand Canyon will disappear as their equivalents and greater have disappeared in the past. Even the Earth and our solar system have a fairly accurately predicted lifespan. Can you name your great-grandmothers, great-grandparents? Probably not. They're gone and forgotten. They were born, they lived, they loved, and were loved. They achieved, and they died. Will your great-grandchild's great-grandchild know your name, let alone your story? When Jesus talked of a destruction of the temple so absolute that no sign of its having existed would remain, he could have been talking about anything or anybody. He could have been talking about me. As Isaac Watts' hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, puts it, time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. Is that good news or bad? It's certainly hard to think of it as good news. I know that I must die sooner or later, the later the better. But to enter oblivion, to have my existence, no matter how significant it appears to me or to others, make no difference to the world, is more than I want to think about, even though there are some things about my life that I'm happy to know will disappear forever. The thought of our disappearance is so distasteful that we seldom think about it. But as the church's year draws to an end, we should reflect on the fact that we too will draw to an end. There can be various reactions to our eventual disappearance. The development of cloning techniques has some people thinking that they can somehow be recreated. They forget that cloned people identical twins, already exist, and they're not the same person. Others live by the ancient dictum, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, a saying which goes back to the Bible. Since my time here is short, I may as well enjoy it and not worry about what others may think. There's some truth in that last attitude, but in a sense that might not seem obvious at first. Thought of my death may indeed free me from worrying about what others think in order to live a life dedicated to God. If I and the scoffers will all be gone one day, why worry about what they may think? Paradoxically, what terrifies some people can give courage to others. For the one important fact that solely concentrating upon oblivion omits is God. God is not subject to disappearing, and neither is God's love. Those of us who know we're loved by God will disappear, but we're confident that something else awaits us. In the words of the funeral mass, for your faithful, Lord, life is changed, not ended. Do I really believe that? Well, sort of, but there are always doubts. Faith is not certainty, it's a choice. I choose, because of the evidence I have experienced of God's loving help in ages past, 
to believe that love will not desert me. If I'm right, I will know. If I'm wrong, I will not know. And in that case, neither being wrong nor having lived at all will matter. Thank mm -hmm. you.